Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you've had a restful winter break. Um, thanks so much for being here for our first Meet VCU Authors event of the semester. My name is Chris Shin, and I am an associate professor in the Department of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies at VCU. I'm also the director of the Health Humanities Lab and the acting director of the Humanities Research Center um, for the spring of 2024. I'd first like to thank the College of Humanities and Sciences and the amazing Ronnie Sisaveth, as well as the new acting assistant director, Eli Costin, for their support and for their help with promoting this event. For those who are new to this series, our Meet VCU Authors um, series invites faculty, students, and members of the Richmond community to come meet VCU authors as they talk about their recent publications and answer questions about their work. It is also a time of celebration, as we know that every book takes many, sometimes many years to complete. Our virtual events follow a more or less similar format. I will introduce our guests who will then speak for about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions from the audience. You can post your questions during and after the talk using the Q&A function on the bottom of the screen. Today, I'm so thrilled to introduce to you um, our own champion of the humanities, um, Christina Stanchu, who is joining us all the way from Canada, where she is currently serving as the first Fulbright Canada Research Chair in Justice and Reconciliation at King's University College at Western University in Ontario. Dr. Stanchu has taught at VCU for 12 and a half years and her scholarship is in Indigenous and Multi-Ethnic Literatures of the U.S. At VCU, she has taught courses in Indigenous Literatures, Sustainable Environments, and Indigenous Studies, the Literature of Residential Schools, as well as graduate seminars in Critical Race Theory and Indigenous Literatures and Visual Culture. She is the author of over a dozen articles in top journals in the field, the editor of the volume Our Democracy and the American Indian and Other Writings by Laura Cornelius Kellogg, um, Syracuse University Press 2015, and several journal special issues, including Pedagogy in Anxious Times for the journal um, uh, Multi-Ethnic Literatures of the United States with an Anastasia Lind, winter of 2017, and a special issue on indigenous periodicals for the journal American Periodicals. With Gary Totten, she has edited the volume Race in the Multi-Ethnic Literatures Classroom, forthcoming from the University of Illinois Press in summer 2024. And she has another volume in the works, Indigenous Media Ecologies, <clears throat> She serves on the editorial boards of major journals such as the PMLA and um, Native and Indigenous Studies and has reviewed fellowships for the National Endowment of the Humanities, ACLS, and Virginia Humanities. As the Fulbright Canada Research Chair in Ontario this spring, she is working on a new book manuscript, Indigenous Education and the Literature of Residential Schools in the US and Canada, which is under contract with the University of Nebraska Press. Dr. Sanchi was born in Romania and was naturalized as a US citizen a decade ago. Her scholarship, teaching, and service are guided by concepts such as relationship, responsibility, reciprocity, and redistribution. Today's talk celebrates the publication of Dr. Sanchi's book, The Makings and Unmakings of Americans, Indians and Immigrants in American Culture, 1879 to 1924, published last year by Yale University Press. The book explores how new immigrants and Native Americans shaped the intellectual and cultural debates over inclusion and exclusion during the nation's progressive era. So Christina, I think congratulations on your new book and welcome to meet VCU authors. Um, and um, this is this is exciting for us to have you on the other side of the of the discussion. <laughs> thank you so much, Chris, and, and great job. Um, and thank you um, to everyone um, joining from all over the world. I see people from different countries and uh, it's just delightful to be back here on this side of, of the desk and uh, on this side of the border, um, as it were. I'd like to thank my colleagues at King's at Western University here in London, Ontario, for welcoming me and for um, making the beginning of this semester such a, a, a thrilling experience. And also, I wanted to thank our dean, Catherine Gracia, for allowing me to get away for a semester to work on this project during such a busy year. Um, I know that land acknowledgements are very problematic, especially if not followed by action, but as a teacher, I deeply value their pedagogical component. So in that spirit, I would like to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of this land, their ancestors and future generations. The Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, the Akhenaten, the Lunapewak uh, peoples in London, Ontario, 
First Nations communities here include the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, the Oneida Nation of the Thames, the Muncie, and the Muncie Delaware Nation. This area has 11 First Nations communities, which is also the number of tribes in Virginia. Um, let me uh, share my screen. Let's see if technology helps. I do have quite a few slides and we probably will not get through all of them. As Chris mentioned, the, the book um, just turned one actually. And because we have been so busy building and rebuilding the center, uh, I honestly did not have time to promote this book. So this is, uh, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to try this. Um, I did a presentation at the MLA uh, just a few weeks ago and I was just thrilled uh, that people found it of interest and I hope you do too. Um, as Chris mentioned, I speak is an immigrant scholar who has worked in, in this is by the way VCU news so <laughs> um, I, I speak as an immigrant scholar who has worked in indigenous studies for almost two decades indigenous history was sorely absent from my own education as it is from my students and so in in my work I try to make sense of this absence um, in the book I'll introduce you I'll introduce to you today uh, which is really three books in one as one of my mentors used to say I juxtapose two groups rarely read together, Native Americans and new immigrants. And by that, I mean um, the op opposite of old immigrants from Northern right, uh, Europe. The new immigrants are immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe at the turn of the 20th century. And I examine their literary and activist work in the context of two Americanization campaigns during the progressive era, which really attempted to make them right into um, good Americans. <laughs> When I started researching this book, which was a while ago, um, I was really struck by the pervasive use of the phrase making Americans in archival documents and titles from the first decades of the 20th century. The progressive era thrived on the rhetoric of making Americans. Uh, the belief that although one was not born an American, one could be made into one in its original context. Making Americans signified endless possibilities for immigrants dreaming of economic and political futures. In a way, this logic of efficiency popularized by Ford Motors and uh, its Americanization program could solve the era's dilemma about two emerging problems at the turn of the 20th century, the immigrant problem and the quote unquote Indian problem. Um, these are some of the titles of the books I write about in my book. As you can see, Jacob Reese's The Making of an American, An American in the Making, The Life of an Immigrant by Marcus Ravage. Um, the high modernist Gertrude Stein also wrote um, a book um, titled The Making of Americans. And then um, many um, progressive era films, industrial films, but also education films tackle the subject. This book started in the special archives at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign where two of the writers I study, um, Jewish immigrant Marcus Ravage and um, indigenous writer, Yavapai writer, Carlos Montezuma were students there and had walked the same hallways a hundred years before. Um, let me see if I can. Okay, just one second. Thank you for your patience. Um, this is Carlos Montezuma. Uh, Carlos Montezuma um, actually offered um, the, the cover for my book, not uh, one of the publications um, he edited. Uh, Wasasha from 1917 um, uh, became the, you know, incorporated into the cover of my book. Um, and um, this was my first um, introduction to ways in which indigenous writers and activists at the turn of the century were thinking about their relationship to Americanization and also to um, immigrants. And the second one, um, I was introduced to this writer, particularly to, to this document, Americanize the First American, when I visited the Newberry Library as a graduate student and an archivist <laughs> took me aside and said, you know, you should definitely see this. This, this will be great for your book. Um, in any case, uh, the rest was, was history. Um, I should also note that, um, as you have seen here um, in the title, I use the um, word Indian in italics. And 
sometimes um, I, I have to explain this um, because it's, it's a reference to the use of the term during the progressive era. And it reflects both some of the ways in which indigenous writers themselves were using it, but particularly how um, what Gerald Visnor calls the literature of dominance referred to indigenous people. So this is the preliminary archive that sort of started this project. And I mentioned earlier uh, the Ford um, Americanization program, which really became a huge engine of Americanization in the 19 uh, teens. And I wanted to show you this, this famous image of the melting pot that I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Um, the story was that uh, this was a public ceremony, of course, and upon graduation from the Ford English School, um, immigrants would 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 go into this proverbial pot, melting pot, and then um, the image on the right, they would emerge as, you know, citizens um, wearing, um, you know, citizens clothing and waving those American flags. Uh, besides these uh, projects, I, I did research in a wide ranging archive of indigenous and new immigrant print and visual uh, culture materials, which I think strengthened the book. Congressional acts, testimonies, newspapers, cartoons, poetry, fiction, um, and, and silent film. And the cover um, I, I mentioned here comes from, from Wasasha, where the indigenous activist on the right holds a pamphlet with his right hand. And as you can see with his left hand, points to the Statue of Liberty. And the implied argument here is, you know, so many immigrants are coming through Ellis Island and they have a real path to citizenship. What about the Indian, right, quote unquote. This was an argument repeated by indigenous intellectuals throughout the progressive era. And in so many ways, as this book developed, I used the story of immigration to tell the story of indigenous representation and self-representation. And I used the paradigm of Americanization as sort of my driving force. What was Americanization or what is? As a cultural, political and ideological project, Americanization has so far offered to my mind, a narrow paradigm for understanding American national formation. Within this grand narrative, as we have seen, Americans can be made <laughs> in a melting pot, right, can be melted, transformed into loyal citizens who renounce foreign or native loyalties. But Americanization also depended on both visual and print culture to fulfill its mission of making Americans. New media technologies, such as the growth of the commercial periodical press, the accessibility of mass market books, the emergence of visual technology like silent film, all enhance the work of Americanization. Ultimately, in this book, I argue that Native and New Immigrant writers and intellectuals um, that I choose to write about both adopted and adapted the settler colonial script as they negotiated the multiple demands of uh, Americanization. But most importantly, I think this book reassesses the centrality of Native cultural production in the context of ongoing colonization through what I call Native acts, rhetorical, performative, militant, and imaginary, legal, and fictional, alongside the better known immigrant acts. And I hope one of the contributions my book makes is to really challenge this pervasive paradigm of the nation of immigrants, right? the United States as a nation of immigrants, which continues to erase indigenous presence from American literature and culture and, and um, really make room for indigenous writers um, and indigenous archives and indigenous stories. If you decide to read this book, <laughs> and I feel like I'm, you know, uh, the library has it, so you don't have to go very far. Um, you'll read about better known writers, uh, if you're familiar with Abraham Kahan, and the lesser known uh, poets, such as the Yiddish poets, writing about Americanization in New York in both English and Yiddish. You will also um, read about public figures, such as Gertrude Bonin. I mentioned her earlier, she was Yankton Sioux and Carlos Montezuma, 
or the lesser known archive of native writing in boarding schools and native periodicals. Some figures may be entirely unknown to readers today, such as Marcus Eli Revich, whose popular memoir, An American in the Making from 1917, was widely taught in New York City. Um, or one of my favorite projects, and I think the book I want to be remembered for, <laughs> not this one, but my previous one, um, Laura Cornelius Kellogg, Our Democracy in the American Indian, um, Thanks to this book, um, she is now included um, in the suffragette uh, statuary, which was unveiled in Seneca Falls, um, New York in 2021. I'm sorry if my computer stops. I'm, I'm not sure if that transmits all the way to Richmond, but uh, occasionally it, it stops here. So I don't know what's going on. Um, I hope we can still, um... okay, great. Um, so <laughs> let's dive right in. In December 1923, on the eve of the country's first comprehensive immigration legislation, the New York Times published an article on an unexpected topic, Aborigine and immigrant. Dealing with new immigrants and indigenous people, the article made clear, was a settler problem to be solved by progressive era Americans. Um, I should mention very briefly that um, in terms of, of demographics, um, we might understand this concept um, or, or this argument better if we think about the U.S. population uh, doubling every 20 years between 1800 and 1900, while the native population uh, entered an alarming decline at the beginning of the 20th century. So to give you an example, by 1890, the U.S. population had grown from about 3.9 million in 1790, which, which is when the first U.S. census right, counted this population, to almost 63 million. Right, so 1890, 63 million people. By contrast, in 1910, the native population counted fewer than 300,000 people. In the US, exceptional this narrative of progress and growth, the story of Native Americans is marginal. Entire nations of people were fractured by settler greed, land dispossession, and genocide. Native people had to live defending their communities from violent settler attacks, the encroachment of civilized, quote unquote, civilization. Pro programs and violence over the la their lands. This is obviously a reference to Ned Blackhawk's work and the continued threats to native sovereignty. By 1923, right when this article came out, the US had already launched a campaign to assimilate Native Americans through federal policy, through neglect, through separation from indigenous communities, a drastically diminished land base and the removal of native children to off-reservation boarding schools. Other attempts at naturalizing indigenous people preceded the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924, uh, which passed shortly after the Immigration Act. So this is where my book actually ends in 1924 with this with these two pieces of legislation I'll talk about in a second. And it really starts in 1879 with the opening of Carlisle Indian School. Um, and um, the opening of immigration door to Eastern and Southern Europe in 1983. On May 26, 1924, President Calvin Coolidge signed into law the Immigrant Act, also known as the Johnson-Reed Act, which reduced drastically the number of new immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe. The Immigration Act introduced a quota system based on national origins and spelling the contours of American citizenship for decades. Only a week later, on June 2nd, 1924, right, um, 100 anniversaries coming up, President Coolidge signed into law the Snyder Act or the Indian Citizenship Act. At the time, two thirds of Native Americans had already become citizens through various congressional acts. Unlike previous statutes or treaties, the ICA did not mandate, this is important, the ICA did not mandate that Native people relinquish their allegiance to their tribe in order to become American citizens. And the sudden interest in the citizen Indian, right, in the 1920s, at the time when the vanishing Indian trope really had dominated popular American culture was symptomatic of larger white anxieties about national identity. Whereas the acquisition of American citizenship ended immigrant second class 
citizenship status. Although, <laughs> as I found um, in, in so many interesting archives, many immigrants and new immigrants also chose not to apply for naturalization and uh, in quite large numbers in, in the 19 teens and 20s. So uh, although acquisition of American citizenship meant all of this for, for, for immigrants, for Native Americans, um, citizenship in 1924 did not end their status as wards, wards of the federal government. As domestic subjects by law, they were legal wards of the federal government living within the borders of the nation state, but lacking full rights um, as individuals. And so Americanization, if, if, if we think about all these, um, you know, ideological, race-based, land-based, capitalist-based mechanisms, right, to homogenize these two groups of, of people, um, um, Americanization was the answer to, to these two problems, right, identified in, in the article I just shared with you. It really became the arc framing the imagined national identities of Native people and new immigrants, um, and as the U.S. entered World War I in 1917, a new brand of patriotic Americanism shaped new formulations of national identity and really brought the reward of citizenship to Native and, and immigrant soldiers who fought in World War I after <laughs> um, uh, you know, their immigrant peers were naturalized. So everything about uh, rights for Indigenous people um, the archive tells us comes as an afterthought, right? After um, you know the naturalization of, of immigrant soldiers and so on and so forth. So, you know, in in very uh, very brief, I argue that this granting of American citizenship to Native people was yet another colonial gesture framed as a gift. This this is where I build on Kevin Bourneil's work framed as a gift from the federal government to the native wards of the state, an inclusion into the national body yet signifying dispossession and further exclusion under the facade <clears throat> of American citizenship. What you're seeing on your screens right now um, are, are several um, slides from you know, the progressive era, major newspapers where, as, as we know, ethnic stereotypes um, um, were represented uh, in, in many ways, uh, sometimes um, in, in funny ways or, or lighthearted ways meant um, to challenge uh, or translate sometimes ethnic and racial anxieties um, originating in the early 19th century when we saw the first sort of nativist movements. Racial and ethnic stereotypes, such as the, you know, the lazy Indians, you saw some, some pictures um, from, from other magazines I showed earlier, um, these were, um, um, these racial and ethnic stereotypes were not only cultural misreadings of one dominant group by the other, but also rhetorical acts with severe economic consequences, authorizing further dispossession of Native people. So these three political cartoons about Uncle, Uncle Sam, you know, really becomes a central character in, in a lot of my chapters. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing, but it's a recurring trope that, you know, both students at Carla's, ne Carla negotiating their own assimilation and Americanization are, are faced with on a, you know, on a regular basis and something that immigrants are co-opted into in, in their English classes and other classes um, as well. So these three political cartoons dramatize the country's changing physiognomy and the subsequent intolerance toward new immigrants and other minoritized groups in the US. The iconography of Uncle Sam underwent several subtle changes in the last two decades of the 19th century from the benevolent Uncle Sam who extends his hands to welcome the new immigrants to the US Ark of Refuge, that's the middle image, um, or the all embracing grandfatherly figure um, right there to the, sorry, I lost my train of thought here, um, or the all embracing grandfatherly figure to the stern embodiment of a new American composite face, the first image on the left in Uncle Sam is a man of strong features, emblematic of the recent changes in the country's racial and ethnic makeup to the disciplinary, and this is the third image to the right, who brings the truant immigrant boy to the little red, white, and blue <laughs> schoolhouse. Um, 
The image on the right is another cartoon from, from the same period. Um, it actually uh, precedes the article in the New York Times um, by a few weeks, I think. And it, it really pokes fun at, at the um, uh, immigration, the proposed Immigration uh, Exclusion Act uh, including an, an indigenous perspective, right? You can't come in the quota for 1620s full, right? I think we've seen quite a quite a lot of similar cartoons in the last decade or so as, as more and more restrictions on other immigrant groups have been um, imposed. And I also wanted to share one of my favorite cartoons. I write a lot about it in one of the chapters by a uh, Crow Creek artist, Robert Freeman, um, who really <laughs> repositions uh, indigenous um, um, agency in, in this debate over immigration and, and makes the Indian character here um, as the head of, of the immigrant office. Again, this came up, um, came out in the very activist uh, civil rights movement context of the 1970s, um, a lot of militancy, and, and it speaks to that 1970s political moment, uh, as well as to earlier uh, moments such as the one illustrated on the right. Uh, now, in the next five minutes or so, I'm going to do um, the boring part of this <laughs> presentation, and um, I might skip some things, but I, I because this is a huge project, um, really uh, three books in one, building on on so many archives. I wanted to to give you a, a sort of a rigorous presentation of of what's in there and and what each chapter does, and then. Uh, we'll look at some more images uh, and then I'll end so we can have enough time for, for discussion. Um, so uh, in, in the first chapter, I turn to legal uh, texts to draw attention to what I call the complicity of immigration restriction laws and federal Indian policy with organized Americanization in legislating this you know, desirable new American. In chapter two, <clears throat> excuse me, I define and historicize Americanization as an ideology, but also as a federal and state sponsored program situating the debate over national identity and citizenship in a much broader racial and ethnic context. Um, and also um, looking at the uneasy places that indigenous and, and immigrant people occupied in the um, American uh, settler imaginary in these narratives of deficiency, which I think we still hear uh, or read about that the work of the Americanizer is reinforced. Chapter three engages a key archive of the book and it's actually the germ of my current project <laughs> I'm working on in Canada, the print records of Carlisle Indian School and other federal boarding schools in the US. And it shows how writing and reading practices in, in those schools mitigated some of the damage that industrial training did to native education um, and shows how print culture really offered the platform for creative expression um, to those students. Chapter four explores Americanization in a new immigrant context, focusing on public schools and foreign language um, newspapers in New York City and Chicago. It traces the ways that immigrant education and print culture supported the work of Americanization, and it illustrates uh, what I call affective Americanization, right, from affect, an insidious form of cooptation through the affective bonds across time and space. Um, and I should say that this is one of my favorite chapters in the book, which also seeks to fill a gap in the current scholarship on the immigrant press and its role in the Americanization project, as well as the um, immigrant treatment of um, so-called Indian tropes in the foreign language publication. So, you know, quick parenthesis, I was very lucky to find this archive at the Newberry Library, digitized archive on the Chicago Foreign Language Press Survey, um, immigrant newspapers translated into English. And in, in mining those, I <laughs> was surprised to read how uh, immigrant writers and journalists, activists, some of them more conservative, were really uh, attuned to what was happening to indigenous people in the US. And they, they I, I think I used the concept convenient, uh, convenient affiliation throughout the book to show uh, these alliances that they were forming, of course, rhetorically, strategically, to really position themselves in these debates over Americanization and to say, you know, um, um, 
this is the, this is not the first time this is happening to immigrants. Look at what happened to Indians, quote unquote. In, in any case, the fifth chapter um, turns to the activist and print work of the Society of American Indians, which was the first militant uh, indigenous militant organization of its kind, and shows that Native intellectuals rewrote this main force of racial difference and authored Americanization on native terms. Often two competing nationalisms, American and native, often overlapping, drove these spirited debates over what it meant to be an American um, citizen. And, and this is this is a fascinating archive to me. Um, there's a version, a chapter, uh, uh, an article published in NACE on, on this topic, which is more the more condensed version. Chapter six turns to Americanization in new immigrant literature using Jewish American writers and their contributions to the literature of Americanization. Like their native intellectual peers, I argue that um, here that new immigrant writers revised the script Americaniz of Americanization as they also shaped the beginnings of new immigrant literature. For grounding the work of first-generation immigrant writers, I show how these counter narratives to Americanization are part of an incipient counter discourse, which I call the quote unquote unmaking of Americans. Um, and the last two chapters examine um, the complicity of the silent film industry with the Americanization campaigns in exploiting the potential of this new medium to reach wider and wider audiences in the US. Early motion pictures perpetuated ideologies of national and racial difference. And like print and other cultural texts, silent film carried and revealed feelings through what I call uh, here and elsewhere spectacular nationalism. So um, thank you for uh, <laughs> for your patience while well, I went through, through this book structure. I promised five minutes. I think I stayed on time. Um, and now um, I think we can move on for, for the remaining 10 uh, minutes or so uh, to um, some <laughs> exciting um, uh, case studies from the book, and then I have a short conclusion where I hope to connect some some of the things I write about in my book, which is set again 100 years ago to um, our contemporary moment. Um, I didn't write about extensively about these these two women, and I didn't use all the images in this presentation in the book. I could only use 30 images, and so um, as as I was preparing this talk, I realized that um, these two women were the anchors <laughs> of the two Americanization programs in those two contexts. On the left here, you see Frances Keller, um, the Americanization crusader, who was a lawyer turned social worker. Uh, an authority on urban immigrants and immigration legislation and a public servant for the New York Commission on Immigration. Uh, she did a lot of things. Um, she um, uh, was on, on um, oversaw the uh, American Association of Foreign Language Newspapers, influenced the Im uh, immigrant press with patriotic pieces and anti-radical uh, propaganda. Um, she also promoted the crusade for Americanism through a short-lived publication I, I write about in a chapter called Immigrants in America Review, which really exemplified nationalism at work. Um, she was also very interested in indigenous issues, and um, we don't have time now, but um, some of you may know that um, in in 1913, th from 1913 to 1916, there were these um, very odd <laughs> um, ceremonies, uh, citizenship ceremonies um, throughout uh, the United States, organized uh, by the the federal government taking President Wilson's message to Native people and, and you know, organizing these very bizarre citizenship ceremonies. Again, this was 1916 before the Citizenship Act, where uh, Native people um, were, I would say, coerced into performing patriotism for the camera, really. Um, and um, this is bizarre <laughs> on, on so many levels. Um, they were patriotic ceremonies funded by the so-called Indian enthusiasts, right? That And they flourished throughout the American West in the 19 teens. Um, the, you may have heard of the Rodman Wanamaker expedition of citizenship to the North American Indian, right? And then the, the subsequent um, citizenship ceremonies organized by the federal competency commission in 1916, determining whether Native people were competent or not to become American citizens. This is another uh, very uh, problematic discussion. 
Um, the gramophone was another new technology co-opted by Americanization fervor, and it really made Wilson's voice resonate <laughs> on reservations. I see Adriana Gretchen Green is here um, in the audience, and I, I relied a lot on, on her work and other performance studies and in, you know, uh, scholars of indigenous studies to think about these instances which um, were, were of interest to Frances Keller because once she learned about these citizenship ceremonies, she started asking, well, why aren't we doing naturalization ceremonies for new immigrants? And after 1916, lo and behold, naturalization ceremonies <laughs> started happening throughout the United States. And in fact, I had mine uh, a little bit um, more than 10 years ago, and uh, it wasn't really traumatic except for the daughters of the American Revolution, but that's a story for another time. Um, the second uh, picture here is of Estelle Rio, who was a superintendent of Indian schools um, and who outlined the new course of study for the Indian schools in the United States, industrial and literary. So the literary really caught my attention here, which really emphasized two categories of instruction, right, industrial and, and literary. Through daily phonic drills and dictation, the native child was taught English and skills for um, English skills, um, English and skills for self-sufficiency, pardon me. To prepare the child to become fit for life, teachers were asked to emphasize, quote, the dignity and nobility of labor, end quote. The curriculum also encouraged mu music education, especially patriotic songs, um, and real recommended outdoor flag exercises by the whole school morning and evening. Um, I found some really interesting footage in the Library of Congress at MBRS um, at Carl, uh, uh, you know, uh, filmed at Carlisle and other boarding schools, but one that really um, complicated the argument I was trying to, to um, I was making in this chapter was the, the footage taken um, during, you know, these 1916 citizenship um, uh, expeditions and in one of them an Assiniboine man um you know is is asked to um pay respect to the flag uh and then to sign uh, a fake declaration of of citizenship and in that footage the man is shown spitting next to the American flag and of course we know there is a lot of work of editing I don't know what comes before and after but I did read that um, instance as 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 pretty bold and and uh, a moment of rejecting um, American citizenship. Carlos Montezuma also writes about um, lots of letters he received as editor of Wasasha from reservations where um, Native people uh, complained um, and and expressed their dissent against um, American citizenship. So um, in, in the time I have left, I'll, I'll take you through some of the pictures I am um, uh, I did not get to use in my book. Some I did, but most I didn't. And, and I, what I want to illustrate is, is these um, parallel histories. And I would be very curious to hear in Q&A how you see them and, and the, the kinds of questions you have. So um, both scenes of Americanization in the immigrant context you see here on the left and indigenous context shared a lot of differences. Um, this is an in, in English class for immigrants on the left, you see the teachers, right, the alphabet, and then uh, to the right, we have the same sort of staged picture of native students at Carlisle Indian School. Industrial training was key to both Americanization programs and of both demographics. And so on the left, you have um, uh, an example of, of a home economics class at Carlisle and uh, the millinery class, right? Um, an evening school. Um, posters, um, um, Americanization materials really uh, dominated um, um, this, um, the debates and, and, and the discourse of Americanization. And um, I wanted to, to share some of, some of these because they, some of them were obviously in English, but uh, in many cases, like the, um, the um, poster here on the right in, in Hungarian, right, were uh, offering guidebooks and um, materials 
to be used in, in immigration classes taught um, in uh, the immigrant's original language. Um, these are uh, more or less famous pictures from Carlisle Indian School, um, the before and after photograph um, on the upper right hand corner. This is Tom Torlino, a Navajo boy who became sort of the, the poster boy of the before and after photographs used by the school to promote its success. Um, lower right hand corner, a picture of Luther Standing Bear and, and his family visiting Carlisle. Luther Standing Bear is, is one of, of my central characters in the book, one of the uh, students who first arrived at Carlisle in 1879 and who really um, rethought, he, he was a, a model student, he was very good friends with Richard Henry Pratt, who became his mentor. But in his later autobiographies, he really rethinks his whole relationship with Pratt and um, with Carlisle. And this is a pamphlet from Carlisle from, uh, I believe, 1913, showing the sort of, you know, before and after and successful Americanization of students. Uh, because I'm a literary uh, scholar and because I work with, with archives, um, I, I did one of my chapters is about the print work at Carlisle and the work of, 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 of printers. And um, I find this, this archive still uh, very, very important despite the many ways in which um, such student publications were controlled and censored by um, school personnel. Um, this is another archive that I'm still thinking about. I wanted to point your attention to the picture on the upper right hand corner. <laughs> this is um, the publication of the Society of American Indians, right? You have a picture on, on, on the left of this, this group of um, um, Native intellectuals who uh, not only organized in, in a Native organization, but who also established a journal and, and really wrote for both uh, Native and mainstream audiences. And when they started marketing their publications later on, they really pitched um, the, the, the journals as, <clears throat> excuse me, books of unquenchable Americanism, which is both interesting and problematic at the same time. Uh, these are some of the um, issues and, and some close-ups of the masthead, of, of the Society of American um, Indians Quarterly Journal, which then later became um, the American Indian Magazine, which still provides um, a lot of resources for how um, indigenous um, activists in the 19 teens and early 20s were thinking about citizenship, were thinking about sovereignty and native rights, and um, they were imagining, in fact, a native university <laughs> at, a, at a certain point, and really the, the future for, for indigenous people uh, they were envisioning. Um, on, on the other side, um, I found some uh, interesting materials in the National Archives um, in, in the, the records on, on Americanization and education, uh, which were quite interesting to look at. Um, both uh, immigrant um, manuals um, issued by the federal government in, you know, in, in, in Hebrew, in Italian, also in English, um, but also uh, writing specimens by, um, by immigrants themselves. Um, I don't have examples here, but um, I, um, I look at um, many letters the students wrote to their teachers and then the teachers sent to um, the Office of um, um, Immigration to um, uh, show how successful their, their program was. Um, and um, to end <laughs> here, um, I wanted to um, to show you a, a few um, images of um, a silent film and the this co-optation of the new medium um, by the Americanization movement. So uh, this was an unexpected turn of the project, and this is why it it really took a little bit longer to finish because I found all these new um, archives, Library of Congress, but also the National Archives. Um, showing uh, the complicity of the federal government in, in, in listing the help of, of the film uh, industry to support and disseminate visual materials in local and national Americanization campaigns. So um, I, I, I did that. And um, 
I, um, I, I found a lot of um, interesting data to support the argument that was emerging anyway. So uh, here on the right is um, The Land of Opportunity, a film from 1921, uh, which was the first um, to be distributed as the initial Americanization production. Um, on the left, Ford Educational Weekly really promoted the work of, of film uh, as instrumental in uh, Americanizing you know, the, uh, the workers at Ford. Um, and this is, is uh, another interesting document from um, 1919, where the Bureau of Naturalization um, issues its own official pictures, right? Uh, show um, and shown uh, free of charge and and distributed throughout um, the United States. We don't have time to talk about indigenous representations in film, but this is um, a sort of a before and after photograph in a, an unfortunately titled film from 1929. Um, which, uh, which fortunately uh, has the reservation scenes uh, filmed in, in uh, New Mexico um, uh, and uh, in, in black and white, where the main character played by a white actor uh, refuses to salute the American flag. We just learned about the Stel Reels flag exercises. So uh, when he refuses, he's punished. And then his uh, Pueblo <laughs> girlfriend at the time, future wife, uh, becomes his teacher. And, you know, several years later, in a different part of the film, we see him, um, you know, um, salute the flag and, and to really uh, become uh, that new American uh, who was envisioned by the federal government. Um, in um, the eighth chapter, in the seventh chapter, um, I look at some industrial and educational films and there were quite a lot of them. Uh, this, is one of, this is one of my favorites and um, I'll, I'll end with The Making of an American Citizen, which um, was done by Alice Guy Blachet. Some of you may know her as one of the first female directors and director of, of silent film images. Um, and I talk about the ridiculousness of, of this whole project and in, in showing how it can become American so, so quickly. And uh, to end, um, I wanted to go back to, to this idea I expressed at the beginning um, of my talk um, about um, how indigenous and, and new immigrant activists sometimes join forces against this, this um, um, innocuous discourse. And uh, to bring it back to, to the present, I wanted to mention that in 2017, indigenous activists joined protests against another race-based US immigration ban, an executive order targeting refugees and travelers from Muslim majority countries bearing Syrian immigrants indefinitely and all refugees from these countries for at least four months. Native historians and activists like Nick Estes and Melanie Yazi, who participated in these protests against the Muslim bans, later popularized by the hashtag no ban on stolen lands, reasserted native so solidarity with immigrants and refugees, reframing the chorus of the popular song, this land is your land, to no bans on stolen land. This continued indigenous solidarity with refugee and immigrant communities is part of a, of a global phenomenon against continued settler domination, extraction capitalism, and continued um, dispossession and exploitation of black, brown, and red people. As we understand the questions at the heart of this book, I hope, in a contemporary context of continued colonial occupation, the focus on the Americanization movement, with its emphasis on patriotic education, conformity, a heightened na nativism and nationalism, xenophobia, and the glorification of white supremacy, um, all of this contributes to a new understanding of our contemporary moment 100 years later as renewed fears of alienism combined with capitalist extraction and ongoing dispossession of marginalized populations continue to define American political economy. Thank you so much. This is it. Thank you so much, Christina, um, for such a um, an amazing taste of a, an incredibly rich um, project. Um, we have a number of questions, actually, and I think um, I'll just read them off, um, if that's okay. I'll condense and read. Um, sure. And then we have a little bit of time for discussion. 
okay. okay. Um, so Jennifer Ho writes, um, I appreciate Dr. Shanshu. Um, so big, big hello to, to Jennifer. Hey, Jennifer. Oh. <laughs> um, contextualizing what may be problematic about land acknowledgements and saying it's important from an educational standpoint, especially given your area of research. Um, so can you talk a little bit about um, land acknowledgements and how you talk about them with your students? Um, mm -hmm. And as a humanities center's direct um, research center director, how you handle them and any connection you see between the recent wave of land acknowledgements in academic and activist spaces and your own research. Um, are these land acknowledgements perhaps a new way of reconceiving Americanness? So yes, in that's two minutes very, or less, yes. <laughs> in two minutes or less. Jennifer, thank you so much for being here and thank you everyone for your patience. Um, I think this is a terrific question uh, and um, you know, um, I didn't arrange this question or anything, but it just so happens that the HRC is, is probably some people on this call know, um, uh, started a working group years ago on land acknowledgement, really thinking about the larger implications for the humanities, for the classrooms. Uh, and uh, this led to uh, um, a task force, which um, the provost office is, is leading. And um, I think we are getting pretty close to um, having the board of visitors approve it and then um, uh, it's it's an important discussion to have, but as I said, uh, land acknowledgements without um, action uh, don't really mean much. And we've seen enough examples of how performative they are and how meaningless they can be to indigenous communities. Um, it's important to educate audiences, especially uh, in, in large settings like this and others, university settings. But at the same time, it's important to acknowledge how a university like ours and other uh, public or private universities are engaging um, this, this work of um, indigenizing the curriculum um, and not just paying lip service, right? Just because other universities are doing this, like what is the action plan, right? Um, so um, I, I think in a sense, yes, if not followed by uh, an action plan, right? A plan to work for and with indigenous communities and to let them drive right this as I, I think at VCU we have tried to to do in a very respectful manner and by engaging many many people and I'm very grateful to all of you who have worked for that but I think if not followed by action and um, um, you know uh, creating programs making space for projects with indigenous communities I think this um this could be co-opted as <laughs> as Jennifer put it as as a new way of reconceiving Americanness yeah um I uh I'm, I can take the next question from Angie Angie Chuang or or Chris please go ahead oh yeah I mean either way um so Angie Chuang um writes thanks for your insightful and important scholarship um, you mentioned that this connection of U.S. Indigenous and immigrant identities in studying assimilation and American making efforts and texts um, is unprecedented. Why do you think scholars have not linked the two groups in this way? Have any prior works approached this way of seeing Americanization? Yeah, that's that's a generous question. Thank you, Angie. I'm not sure if I, I use the word unprecedented. Um, I, I think that would be very <laughs> disingenuous of me to do so. But I think um, I, I mentioned that it, it, it puts these two archives in conversation with each other for the first time. And it really uses the immigrant archive to center the indigenous one, right? So it, it starts from the better known story of um, you know, immigrant writing and um, immigrant literature to tell the story of, of um, indigenous um, activism and literature. Um, there are previous uh, studies and, and one of the most influential uh, ones to my work was uh, Ellen Trachtenberg's uh, Shades of Hiawatha, right? Where he talked primarily about performance and how uh, Jewish uh, performers and, and writers, again, used Indian quote unquote tropes at the turn of the century um, to engage uh, issues of American, you know, of American identity. Um, I was really interested in what indigenous people themselves had to say in these debates. So I was not in, interested in just um, 
how immigrant writers use tropes of indigeneity, but really how indigenous. So where were the indigenous people in these conversations? And I hope my book, um, uh, my book does that. Um, uh, historians have done uh, some interesting work. There's a scholar uh, at the University of Toronto who wrote this book just before mine came out and we were able to talk about it. Uh, of course, I'm blanking on his name, but uh, the title of his book is The Jews Indian, where he talks about um, interesting ways in which um, uh, Jewish immigrants, particularly in the West throughout the 19th century, appropriated a lot of um, indigenous causes and, and exploited indigenous people for economic profit, but how some other um, Jewish um, groups in the 1930s, 40s and 50s become advocates um, for, for indigenous groups and think of you know Cohen's uh, Federal Indian Policy Book and, and many others. I realize we are at time here. So Angie, thank you so much for this. I, I hope this makes sense. Um, moving on, Chris. Okay, thanks. So Jessica Trisco Darden asks, what role did naming practices play in the perceived naturalization um, of Indians and immigrants? I'm thinking of the book, A Rosenberg by Any Other Name, A History of Jewish Name Changing in America, and wondering how this manifested itself in terms of the writers you examine here. Um, thank you, Jessica. Yes, this is, um, I don't know this particular book, A Rosenberg by Any Other Name, but as you know, uh, naming and, and renaming um, is, is, has been central to, um, to immigration history. Many immigrants having, having to change their names at Ellis Island or in, in Angel Island in the West uh, um, for various reasons. Um, and naming also became a strategic way uh, to become American, right? To Anglo-Saxonize one's name. Um, and for instance, one of the authors I, I, I write, who is actually from Romania, Marcus Revich, right? His original name was Revich, um, changed to Ravage, right? At Ellis Island. Um, uh, objected to, to, to this Americanization of his name and later in life went back to his name. Uh, it's, it's a little more complicated in, in an indigenous context because um, um, federal Indian policy and particularly in the boarding schools really um, fought for, 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 for changing students' identities, which often included uh, changing their names, right? So Luther Standing Bear um, is Otak T, but Otak T, his original name, uh, has no place at Carlisle or in other contexts uh, because he has to be identified by his American name. Uh, there was a very random a uh, way of selecting um, indigenous student names at Carlisle simply by by placing um, you know a pen or or you know piece of wood in the Bible and wherever it landed that was the name of the student right we have lots of documents about how random this this process was uh, so I think it's 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 a very interesting question and I will have to think a little bit more about this naming as a strategy for both um, uh, belonging and also also for exclusion, which is really the focus of my book. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks. We have a couple more questions. I'm wondering, um, do we have time to answer um, one more or should we wrap? What do you think? Absolutely. Okay, so John Glover asks, um, so Dr. Stanchi, when Dr. Dickinson, um, so Michael, uh, Michael Dickinson uh -huh. from History spoke to us in 2022 about American slavery, you asked, paraphrasing, how he oh. kept going when working on very hard subject matter. What gives you strength and resilience <laughs> when researching American identity and the long history of parsing who is or is not eligible to be an American during our increasingly fraught national conflicts about migration and national identity? Oh, wow. Well, this is a very generous question, John, which I hope we can, um, you know, get to the bottom of uh, over coffee when I return to Richmond. Um, but um, I, I think, um, you know, I think as an outsider to indigenous history and 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 literature, um, I um, it's not as emotionally taxing as it is for for indigenous scholars. And um, I think studying immigration history and and learning, you know, about um, my own history and and you know the the history of of immigration from southern and eastern Europe in in, in this context has. Um, has given me hope that, um, you know, <laughs> resistance is not futile and um, that um, I, I have to teach these materials. I don't really get to teach a lot 
of, of the arguments in this book. I used to teach a course on, you know, coming to America, immigration or immigrant literatures, but I haven't taught that in many years. Um, I, I think, um, I don't know, I, I think just, just passion and um, really as, as I did with the Kellogg book, um, my, my goal is to really put these texts into circulation and to, to bring texts back into the canon because there is a wealth of materials that have not even um, you know, seen print. They're lying in archives, most of them colonial archives. So if we can indigenize you know, a little bit colonial archives, I think that's, you know, th this is what excites me. And if we can work with indigenous scholars in the process, I think this actually excites me more. So uh, I know it's a short answer, but um, I think you know, um, the struggle continues, John. <laughs> Um, we have one more question. I know that people do have to go, so um, but, but we'll, we'll, we'll wrap with this one. Um, so Mimi um, Winnick asks, thanks, uh, or comments, thanks, thank you for a terrific orientation to your book. I'm coming at this with a perhaps mistaken assumption that new immigrant communities in North America in this era were largely urban, while native communities were rural. Is this right? If so, how do the urban or rural settings of native communities and communities of new immigrants affect the makings and unmaking of Americans um, in these different contexts? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really good question. I think it's a fair question. I don't know if you caught the the numbers, um, the discussion about demographics um, earlier on, but it's very true that, uh, you know, the time, progress, the progressive era um, rolled around a lot of the U.S. population, particularly, um, you know, new immigrant populations were urban. Um, as I mentioned, uh, in 1910, there were 300,000 indigenous people. And if you think back to contact, we are thinking more than 5 million indigenous people. So um, I think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, that history of genocide and the conditions that have decimated indigenous populations that had previously, you know, created you know, wonderful cities, we still have mounds, we have, you know, historical records um, to to um, to talk about indigenous cities before colonization here and, and in, in Latin America. So um, I think, you know, bringing students to boarding, indigenous students from re remote reservations to Carlisle was a way to, you know, bring, um, uh, you know, bring indigenous people to the city through this forced, um, education process, but um, I also think it's it's important to think about, you know, this rural uh, versus urban um, dichotomy um, in, 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 um, in terms of removal. I don't know how many people know that, um, you know, especially after 1887, after the um, Removal Act, The Dawes, the after the Allotment Act, excuse me, the Removal Act was earlier in the century, 1930s, uh, 1830s. After the 1877 Dawes Allotment Act, which parceled lands into in severalty and attempted to make indigenous people into farmers, um, about 90% of indigenous land was lost. So I think if we think urban or, or rural, um, I think, sure, urbanization, all of that, uh, the association of indigenous people with ruralness and savagery and, and that sort of thing was, was really written into, uh, you know, these narratives of progress that, that white Americans were um, uh, contributing. So um, a lot of the tribes, 500 nations in the United States lost the original land base. I don't think it matters if it's urban or rural, right? A lot of nations lost their ancestral land base. And, and for me, this is key. In the At the end of the 19th century, uh, as more and more quote unquote progressive, red progressives or native progressive intellectuals traveled throughout the country, traveled the world, Laura Cornelius Kellogg, for example, went to Europe, learned from, um, you know, German um, geography and, and architecture and, and came back to rethink indigenous villages in terms of, of sustainability. Um, I, I don't think that distinction between urban and, and rural is, is as, as um, 
trenchant. And um, throughout the 20th century, I, I think even now, the most of the native population lives in urban areas. Um, but I would say that there is a lot of movement to buy back land, which is very important. Um, and also to create that sense of belonging and nationhood, um, regardless of urban or rural space. I hope this makes sense. Thank you. Um, I think we should um, wrap here. Um, I know that many of us have a lot of other questions for Christina, um, who I know is always welcomes and responds very quickly to emails, offers of coffee, um, shares meals. So um, even from even from Ontario, and definitely when she returns, <laughs> um, we can we can all continue to engage um, with her and her research. And um, we'd love to hear more about your um, project in Ontario as well. So thanks again for that really brilliant um, talk, um, really generative. And thank you everyone for making the time um, to come and join us for our first um, for our first um, VCU Meet the Authors. We're looking forward to seeing you again soon. Mm -hmm. Thanks everyone. Have a great week. <laughs>